I wanted to be doing something important and, and that what I was doing was not important enough. And that was actually one of the reasons I left the music industry. A lot of my work actually is in the podcast field. Just like with film, I realized that you can make a big impact. As I ended up transitioning from playing banjo in Sounds of Isha to running sound for them. Mahim is probably the most difficult sonic environment you could ever create if you tried. You know, you can be on one side of it whispering and someone on the other side can hear you. My stay was three months before the consecration of Adiyogi and three months after. So I got to be there for the whole the whole build-up period, the consecration itself, and then after. There was no conscious decision for me to decide to become healthy. All of a sudden, stopped eating fast food and become vegetarian and stopped drinking without any, any thought or, or effort that I really remember. I think just the Isha Kriya functioning, and for the first time, there was just this really clear separation of my mind and my body and myself. Namaskar, everybody, and welcome back to the podcast. In this episode, we have Charlie Garcia from the US. And he is a sound engineer and has been part of Sound of Isha. He helped Isha Foundation in large events with sound and supporting sound. And he was also part of the, the Adi Yogi Abode Consecration at the U.S. Ashram. We talked about his spiritual journey. We talked about him being involved in the in the film industry and the music industry and what being a sound engineer really means i hope you enjoy this one thank you so much for for joining um once again i i'm so so happy and grateful to have you on here because i've been looking into into sound and and frequencies and um and also started to teach myself try to teach myself music production I I bought a Mridangam. I'm learning the Mridangam uh, classical which, Indian. Which is the Mridangam? Oh, oh, I forget all the names of the different drums. This one. Oh, uh, okay, great. Oh, is the the, the two hand? Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I have all this like when I do sound for the the Isha band. I have all this like shorthand that I use for all the different drums and they're not that right names at all. I just like have my own nickname for each drum on the mixture so I know which one is which. Hmm. And so, and um I guess I I got into to sound and music at um when I was around seven, eight years old. I my teacher at that time, first grade, second grade, somewhere around that time, she noticed that I was not able to pay attention and so she was talking to my parents and she said I have a tendency towards ADHD she's not sure about it but she doesn't really want me to like to send me to the doctor because they will prescribe me medicine what she thinks will be better um, is to start to play um, instrument and so she suggested to play the piano you know and what a, what a blessing. I mean, instead of taking medicine to go into learning an instrument and it helped me quite a lot. It really grounded me, even though I have to say I was not ex like super, super passionate with it. I was not like, I want to play in front of people and crowds and everything. I want to become a professional piano player, but still it did a lot for me. So I would love to know your background, um, how how the sounds happened, how music happened to you, how you got into it, uh, a little bit about yourself. You can introduce yourself to the audience. Yeah, for sure. Um, I'm Charlie. I am an Isha meditator and uh, a podcast producer, sound engineer. I work with film. I used to work with music, but mostly film and podcast these days. Um, <clears throat> My, you know, my, I grew up in a musical family. My dad was a music, is a musician. My mom was a musician. So, it, you know, I grew up with a lot of it around me. Um, and I think it was when I started to get near high school. No, it was middle school. It was around maybe seventh grade when I think I finally picked up a guitar. I had played trombone when I was young in, in jazz bands at school, but 
I think like you, it was just, you know, not particularly passionate about it. It was just what your parents said to do. So you yeah. did it. Yeah. <laughs> and actually I built up so much resistance because do like afterwards, after I was like, am I just doing this because of them? I'm not doing this for myself. And I kind of left music for quite some time. And only now I'm getting back into it. That's interesting. Well, you know, when I, when I came back into it, I came into it for myself. Like when, when I found music again, a little, you know, a handful of years later, I guess, I don't know how old you are in seventh grade, like 14, something like that. You know, that was, I found it cause I wanted it. Uh, it was cool. It was so cool then. And you know, at that age, you're interested in girls too. And you're like, want to do things that girls will like and girls like guitar. And then it turns out that I actually liked it too. Um, and that was, you know, where I just kind of found myself fitting into the world was through music at that point, all through high school. Um, I was, I started singing and, and writing songs and playing guitar and all this. And it really was just how I kind of had, you know, especially at that young age, really trying to find your place and not, and being quite unsure about many things. That was, you know, a little safe zone where I could like feel comfortable and feel confident. Um, and uh, I, I had a little like little band with a friend of mine and my cousin who's maybe 10 years older than me was producing music in Nashville. He was just starting out and um, we went up there and, and made a little album with him, like a five song EP. And that process was, just electrifying it was so exciting and so fun and like at that moment i knew that i wanted to do exactly what he did that was um, music production at that time that was music production um yeah and and uh so it was like it was like instant i i immediately quit the soccer team so I could get a job to go buy recording equipment. <laughs> um, and, and I did, you know, I, 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 I guess I did have a tendency even then to just like find something and just make a beeline straight for it. So I worked uh, going door to door selling lawn care quotes and uh, I bought a little interface and a microphone and I just started recording everybody, all my, friends in high school and um i ended up i i found a producer to do an internship with where i didn't i didn't do, do much other than set up microphones but being able to watch this guy work was uh you know i learned so much just from being there so even by the time i left high school you know i had some level of, of competency around sound Um, and, uh, yeah, so I, I went to college for, for sound engineering. I went to, uh, middle Tennessee state up near Nashville, which is a, a pretty big school. There's a, there's a really large audio engineering program there. And, um, I loved, I loved it. It was super fun, you know, spending college, staying up all night in recording studios, uh, it was, I don't know, that was, was definitely my idea of a fun way to spend the college experience. Um, and I mean, going, going back, I don't know if I would have done it because you really don't need a four year degree to, to, you know, pursue a career in audio. Um, but it was really fun and I learned a lot and, and actually, uh, finding my way to that school also helped me find my way to Isha, which, um, you know, alone was, was worth it. Mm. Yeah. Tell us more, tell us more about that. How did that play together? Because I feel like spirituality and music are so connected. They're just like molded together because even at the, you know, certain when, when we, when we do uh, initiation, when we do, um, for our practices, you know, we do an invocation and then sound is always there when we come in, when we enter the hall, so many, like just everywhere. It's so important. So yeah. How, how did that, how did that come together? 
Yeah, it was. It, it wasn't. It wasn't actually sound that that led me in any way. Like it, it turned out that there, there did end up being this amazing um, connection between my my spiritual life and, and the sound life. But, but the way I, I got there really was just you know like everyone else searching for something. Like you're, I was looking for something and it wasn't there and I didn't know what it was and you know probably 20 20 years old or 21 or something like that and I had just you know come on a point where I was really questioning a lot of things and looking for something I was reading a lot of books I uh, didn't you know I just knew there's you know when you have the search you just you search it's just like a it's like an itch um and I guess because of that, it ended up leading me there. I I learned that there was a meditation club, um, and I didn't I didn't know what meditation really was at this point. I didn't have any experience with it, but I had read a book in high school about meditation, so I was you know it was interesting for me. <laughs> um, so there was this meditation club at MTSU. And I, I went one day and there was, there was no one there except for one, one person. I don't know if you, do you know, do you know Jason Cutler? He's a Hatha teacher. I think so. I think so. He, he was at Triple Life for a while. Mm. Um, he, he was there and, uh, you know, he just kind of showed me some said guru videos. <laughs> um, it wasn't remarkable, you know, or anything, but, but I got interested and I think I kept coming to meetings where, and there were more people, um, uh, Rishi, uh, well, Purcell, I think is his last name, um, is another Hatha teacher. He and his family were involved with uh, the meditation club. So they eventually took us down to the ashram and I saw it and- Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it was just like, <laughs> I was led right there. And keep in mind that the, it was like my backyard. MTSU was 45 minutes uh, from from the ashram in Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Mm. So it was right there, and I was I was shocked that um, this this place was right there or in my practically my backyard. Wow. Um, and I was really interested. I think I think I took Isha Kriya. I took Isha Kriya online, mm. and that like you know I was pretty gung ho about it. I was <laughs> practicing it every day, and they let me come. And volunteer for a uh, for a like ten days or over a winter break. I came to do the inner engineering online program. They had a thing where for for students we could come and uh, volunteer and take the program. So I would I would take one session each day, and it was just you know it was it was explosive it was it was huge because i really put myself into it like i really did i would wake up with the residents and do my isha kriya and then go and do the sessions and then volunteer um and it, it was just like <sighs> everything all this stuff like flooding on me and I, I remember just sitting on the bed in one of the dorms just like bursting just like flowing with bliss and just you know thinking like what is going on here <laughs> like i'm not doing anything what is going on and you know that that was how i left and i had actually had this amazing experience when i left the ashram i remember where i think just the isha kriya functioning and for the first time there was just this like really clear separation of my mind and my body and myself as I was just I just gotten in the car to drive away and it just kind of hit me for a minute I was just looking at it and at that point I had no idea what I was getting into but I knew that whatever this was I had to uh, I had to keep exploring it um, and so said guru was coming to Atlanta to do a, a program I think a few months later in, in uh, was it was April 2013. So I did my Shambhavi initiation with him. And I just rushed right into it. I did BSP like a month later. <laughs> and at that point, you know, I had it just had touched me so, so deeply that um, I knew I wanted to have a really, really 
big part of this. Um, but, but I went back to, to, you know, I went back to school. I was, I was, I think I was a junior in school then. And it, it's really interesting looking back how it changed my, my time in college. I mean, I, I remember even just health wise, like there was no conscious decision for me to decide to become healthy, but all of a sudden I was just eating like quinoa and avocados and, you know, I like stopped eating fast food and become vegetarian and, you know, stopped drinking and, and without any, any thought or, or effort that I really remember. Um, and it just completely, completely in, in the course of a few months changed so much about me um, doing the, doing Shambhavi continuously and I have memories of sitting in, in my classes, just like breathing <laughs> so good, <laughs> like just so good, just sitting there in these classes. <laughs> um, and like, it's a great way to go through college. I'm really thankful <laughs> that that happened when it did. Um, but, but it also was a little tough because, you know, um, in, in there's different influences in college and, and, you know, a lot of, especially in the music scene, there's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of smoking and things like that. So you're still around that world. Um, and it, it creates a little bit of a conflict when, you know, when, when all of a sudden your, your friends are doing things just that aren't interesting to you. Um, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's a bit confusing for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's <laughs> it was all great. And I started volunteering for Isha, I guess, around that time. Um, but I, I graduated and I went up to Nashville. And I was working in Nashville in the studio world um, with a lot of bluegrass artists. And I got to work with Alison Krauss and some really amazing uh, artists up there. And, and but you know, I really wanted, I had had these amazing experiences with the ashram and I really wanted to, to go deeper into that. Um, and I really consciously understood that the path that I was on, like I, I was really lucky and I, I got a great um, uh, assistant position for a really amazing, excuse me, a really amazing engineer. Um, but I realized that if I followed that path at that time, uh, it, it would never leave me an opportunity to explore um, the the spiritual side. It would never it would never give me an opportunity to take the time at the ashram that I wanted to because, you know, it's a very demanding field. The music industry is not easy by any means, um, and I fully understood that you know you can go a year without a vacation. Um, so I really wanted to go down to the ashram, but I was, I was very wrapped up in what I was doing. And eventually it just kind of fell on me. I had a friend who was kind of making a similar decision where she, you know, was quitting a lot of what she was doing and doing her own kind of spiritual um, journey. And I remember saying to her, you know, I really want to go to this ashram, but I have this great job that I worked so hard for and this house and, and this. And I remember she just said, okay, quit the job and sublease the house. <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, I can do that. <laughs> like, that's really easy when you put it that way. So I did that day. I think I, I emailed the ashram that day. Uh, a couple of days later, I, I told my boss I was leaving. And the day after that, told the roommates, and then I was on the way, on the way to the ashram. It was that easy, actually. Wow, wow. How, how long did you, 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 you were a resident then at the ashram? No, I wasn't a resident. It, and it was a six month stay. Um, it actually, they didn't offer Sadhanapada over this time. Uh, this was 2015. Mm -hmm. and, but the stay actually was, very close to what the the sadhanapada dates are funny enough like i think i came in in, in july um and left around the new year so i don't know exactly the sadhanapada dates but i think it's mm -hmm. it's the same what's the 
what's the time of the year called? Um, sun, the, I, I mean, the, the sun, 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 yeah, <laughs> yeah, from July to Mahasharatri in March. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I went down there, and I mean, you know, I could talk for the entire interview just about the time at the ashram um as i'm sure you know so powerful i came in and my first weekend was uh shakti chana kriya um and so that was what like kicked off my whole mm -hmm. day there was a shakti mandala and uh i remember it just being really powerful like really really powerful <laughs> going through that mandala while being at the ashram you know, it was just, it was crazy. <laughs> it's like things are really starting to shift every single day in ways that I can't, I mean, I can't remember it was a long time ago, like specifically what those were, but I just remember the overall feeling of, wow, like this is crazy. <laughs> um, and it, it was hard though. It was super hard for me too, especially early on. I had a lot of like physical issues. I wasn't doing asanas yet so i had a lot of back pain and you know getting on with the ashram schedule mm -hmm. is not like the easiest thing to do <laughs> for some people um and uh you know it's, it's it's a different a different way of life um but it was amazing and it was interesting because my stay was three months before the consecration of adiyogi and three months after so I got to be there for the whole the whole build up period of the consecration, the consecration itself, and then after, and that itself was amazing. Um, yes, please tell uh, tell us more <laughs> about this. I've I've never met anybody who was part of the Adiyogi abode consecration. <laughs> I had someone who was part of the Linga Bhairavi consecration at the ashram. <laughs> Uh, Adi Yogi consecration at the ashram, the Yogeshwara Linga in India. But this, I <laughs> yeah, please share. How was it? <laughs> it, was, it was it was a lot. <laughs> it was a lot. Like the build up to it was super intense. Mm -hmm. From for right around the time I got there, it was starting to, you know, the construction was starting to come along, and it was starting to really kick off, and then maybe a month and a half before is when it really started to like get serious. And you had teams like these teams working on the statue for on 24 hour shifts. I mean, it was like you, so the statue, do you know how they brought it in? Have you seen pictures? So the, the first thing when they built this place was they built the foundation of the, like the cement foundation then they brought in these the giant stones and then they brought in the statue. So before the building was built, you had these giant stones with the box there and inside the box was the Adiyogi. Um, and so, but it, but it was, it, well, they finished the building, but then the, the, um, the sculpture was still kind of unfinished. So there was a, a really long polishing process so I remember seeing guys and girls that would be like suspended, like off the ceilings, like hanging upside down, polishing the eye or, or something like this and um, working these amazing, amazing like shifts. I, I was really incredible to see what everyone put into that. And um yeah, it was just it was just really, really intense leading up to it. And then I remember the consecration itself. Sorry, it's hard to remember because it was just a long time ago. I'm I'm realizing this is this is five years ago and it's you know, memories kind of slip. Mm -hmm. Um but I remember actually I wasn't helping with sound for that, but I was on a the video team had bought a like a boom a crane you know those like you'd see at a, at a sports event a 15 or 20 foot metal incredibly heavy swinging camera crane um and that's actually what i ended up doing even though 
the vol- it was it was myself and another volunteer who had no idea what we were doing <laughs> and we ended up on this like actually very dangerous <laughs> device that you could easily hurt or kill someone with <laughs> that's actually another thing like you know just with like the whole lead up to the consecration i mean there's obviously so much grace involved in everything that happens at the ashram but um <laughs> you know there's just with the construction and all the getting ready there's just a lot of things that are in any other context for all to say this way probably not very osha friendly if like osha the, the work uh, safety <laughs> administration in the us like um but at the same time everything happens so incredibly smooth and in this beautiful way um and you know, the, the consecration itself, I think it was a four day process. Um, and I, I remember pretty clearly, a lot of it is, is a bit of a blur for me, uh, you know, also just with the lack of sleep and the long hours and the late nights, you know, it all does kind of blur together. Um, but I really vividly remember when it was finished, how you would walk in the building and it would just, all you could do was sit. <laughs> like you didn't have a choice. Like like your legs would just kind of come out and all you could do is just sit because it was just so overwhelmingly powerful. Mm. I did enjoy, I did enjoy the space when I went, <laughs> I, went I, I came and um, yeah, it was, it was quite, quite powerful. Definitely. You can, you can sense it. You know what I do? I do. There's one thing I do remember about the the consecration process that was amazing was that I think it was the day of like the, the first day it was going to start. It was maybe an evening start and it was nowhere near ready. Like the the building, I don't think it was even like complete. I, I don't I don't remember exactly, but, you know, it was it was not yet a, a temple by any means. And then it just was, it was like, I we left for a few minutes and came back and, you know, the volunteers had done everything with the carpets and all of a sudden it was just ready. I mean, it was like, it was like the fishes and the loaves miracle, you know, <laughs> with Jesus. It's like, it's not there, but it, then it is. Um, and I, I remember just being amazed by that. And, and, and since then, I've seen a lot of that with Isha, with many, many programs of <clears throat> it's not ready. And then it somehow just in the nick of time, it is. Uh, can you share about uh, your experience of, of, of being part of, of, of Sons of Isha more? Uh, how, how you as a, a sound engineer, how you were uh, involved in, in, in certain projects or programs like the Mystic Eye? I, I saw that I was there as well in New York and um, and how how that was how how yeah was that, that that was Madison Square Garden yes okay yeah that has been like one of the adventures and challenges of my life has been <laughs> um working with Isha in, in this capacity um it's been like the biggest blessing and one of the most difficult things I've ever, ever had to do. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, early on, I was, I was playing with Sounds of Isha, um, and I'm, I'm definitely a better audio engineer than I am musician, and it just kind of, I think there's just less resistance in me towards the audio process, and also that was really needed. So, this was over the course of probably a few years, I ended up kind of transitioning from playing banjo in Sounds of Isha to um, running sound for them. And every job, every volunteering job at the ashram is, is hard, but sound is really, really, really hard. Um, in, in, in every single, in every way, it's usually worst case scenario as far as, as far as like the situation that you're in. Um, I mean, Mahima just, you know, Mahima is probably the most difficult sonic environment you could, like, you could ever create if you tried. Um, you know, you can be on one side of it 
whispering and someone on the other side can hear you. So imagine what happens when you amplify that sound a hundred times. Um, you know, learning how to do that has been really difficult. Um, but, but yeah, with all the, the mega programs, I started, I don't know when, three or four years ago, um, doing sound for the mega programs like the Mystic Eye and uh, the many cities we with Sadhguru's done San Francisco and LA and New York and Dallas and Toronto and Miami and all these all these mega programs and um, you know these are really big productions that that you know if if this was a was a business you'd have like very experienced teams doing these productions. Um, but with, with Isha, you know, <laughs> we're all, we're all volunteers. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty crazy, <laughs> but, um, I, I was really kind of thrown into the fire because I'm not a live sound engineer. I don't claim to be a live sound engineer. I'm a post-production engineer. I, I live in studios and that's my world. Live sound is a very different, uh, kind of scenario. So um, going into these big halls where you have, I don't remember, like you have like 4,000 people in this giant convention hall was so far out of my uh, comfort zone. Um, and, you know, through the years, I just had to figure out how to do it because it needed to be done. And, you know, there, I mean, there was no one else to do it. <laughs> and, you know, it definitely was sadhana. It can be incredibly humiliating when you have 4,000 people in the crowd staring at you because there's some feedback and said guru. Like that's, you know, quite terrifying to be in my little, my little box in the corner and then something happens and he'll just turn to me and give me this look. <laughs> There's nothing to motivate you to to fix what's happening faster than that. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it's amazing looking looking back um, into my time in school, learning audio. Like the, I remember having this feeling a lot when I was in school that. was because it didn't feel like I was making enough impact like on the on the world by doing that you know and then somehow I found my way to being able to do sound for said guru and to like have a part in these mass initiations I mean it was just it, there's nothing else I could ask for as far as having an impact on the world using mm -hmm. sound so I'm so feel so lucky that I've been put in in those situations, even though they have tried every little bit of my patience, and um, uh, it's been so hard. But but you know that's what it's about. <laughs> that's that's why we're here. We're here to 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 make an impact and and make the world better. And I'm so thankful that I was able to. To somehow do that with with the skills that I've learned. Mm. Break limitations. <laughs> yeah. It's everything. Ego's limitations, everything. <laughs> yeah. But it's also just been fun at the same time. Like I love the team so much. Um, you know, there's there's like a core team of of the video, the video people and uh some of the teachers and uh a few other sound people who we get to work together on these programs and um you know though it's stressful at times it's also just so fun and i love them and i'm so appreciative of the work that they do like i i see all the work that goes into these programs like the months and the months and the months of incredibly difficult stressful work and i just like some of these volunteers i just they're like heroes to me i mean they're just doing the most amazing, amazing things 
Mm. Yes, yes. I can, I can, I can only imagine when you speak about the, like there is nobody who's really experienced, like fully, fully experienced, and then somehow it still happens. It's a, it's yeah. a, it's such a wonderful experience to be a yeah. volunteer. Totally, and and the equipment's never right. You know, the the, the equipment's never right. The situation's never right. But it all happens, and it happens beautifully somehow. And every single time, like you know, you can look back at the end of one of these programs and just like be so thankful and happy that you were able to be a part of it. You know, sometimes I'll, I'll, we get a notification of like of another program and the first thing is just dread. <laughs> just kind of like, oh no, we have to do this again. And then after it's done, you're just, you're just like, oh, thank you. Like, thank you for letting me do this again. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, and when we talk about sound and, and sound being part or music being part of, of spirituality, I would love to know about um, when you studied sound engineering, did you ever look into, um, I know it's a lot of, you work with frequencies and like do, uh, doing certain things. Mm, did, did you ever look into uh, solfagio frequencies? Is that something that uh, that sounds familiar? Tell remind me what it is. Uh, it's 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 using s sound to to heal the the human system to heal the human body. So solfagio frequencies. No, I really don't know much about any kind of sound healing. Hmm. Um, it's, I mean, I know a lot about the technical aspects of sound. Yeah, um, please please tell us about the the you know how how it's how it's structured or what what you what you learned what you feel like now afterwards like once once you're out what are some projects that you work on maybe right now you know just for people to kind of know what a sound engineer is actually doing yeah so totally so what i do well i'll i'll say this i like I said, I always, I've always been very focused on trying to have an impact through my work because I just, I want, I want to be useful. I want to, you know, make, help make a better world. Um, so after I left the ashram, after my long stay, I was very confused about what, what to do, if I could do that, how I could do that. I didn't want to go back to the music industry. So for a few years, I just worked as an installation tech, installing systems and, and, was not really sure what the next step was. And eventually I realized that media is so important right now. Like as Sadhguru says, you know, it's the first time in history that we have this kind of technology where you can spread a message around the world. And I realized that sound is a really important part of that. Um, so I kind of set this intention without knowing where I was going, that I want to use my skills and somehow find a path with that that can make a difference. So initially I thought that was in film and that was what I set out to do. I, um, a few years ago, I, I moved out to France and I needed quickly to find remote work. So I, that was kind of the whole thing had come together. I realized I could do this film thing. So I just started diving into learning how to do sound for film, which is very different than doing sound for music. Um, I, it's, it's a lot bigger, it's a lot more complicated. When you're doing sound for music, everything's recorded in a studio. Like that's easy because it's recorded in a studio. When you're doing sound for film, it's recorded out on the street or the forest or in a city and the actors are running around or, or, or jumping and the mics are rubbing and there's a whole, other suite of technical challenges that you have to deal with. Um, so that's that, like, I'm just right now, I'm just thinking about <laughs> movies that I've seen and, and then how clear the voice actually sounded and how did they make this happen? That's so crazy how much work goes into that. It's incredible how much work goes into it. Like, <laughs> that, 
incredible you, you should you know my my favorite part of most movies are the credits so i can see the mm. sound teams and how you know you'll have a sound team that's like 30 people mm. um so and, and even more incredibly sometimes you have very small crews as well um but you know there's just so much to it and, and over so over the course of a few years I just learned, I tried to learn everything I could. I read every blog, I read every book, I went on Reddit forums and Facebook forums and talked to everyone I could. I just started taking films and figuring it out in, in every way that I could. And, you know, it it's really humbling, I, I think. Um, and it really makes me respect the, the, the people who have really become experts at this field because it's just so highly highly complex and you know you have all the different elements you have some the 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 elements of post-production is you have a dialogue editor well first of all you have a sound recordist on set who's recording and, and that person is like a miracle worker i have so much respect for the location sound guys and girls that do their thing because um that's such a difficult job when you're the sound guy and the directors don't really care. I mean, they, they care in the long run about sound, but in the moment, they don't really pay attention to the sound. So those sound guys have to fight for everything that they get. Um, but they're the ones who set it up for the dialogue editor to, to succeed. So someone is editing the dialogue and you're taking your finding the whole recorded file and then you're taking little pieces of silence and you're building what we call them bridges like you're building a bridge out of that so that you can connect all the different um pieces of i'm gonna say that i'm gonna re redo that and say that again so as a dialogue editor you're taking pieces of silence of room tone which is like air conditioning or you know generator hum and you're you're kind of building these sections of them and and then adding the noise and that's how you make it smooth because otherwise if you've ever seen like the rough cut of a film what you have is when the when the cut changes from one actor to the next the background noise will change too so you'll have this something like that it's very unnatural so the dialogue editor is, is smoothing all these things out and um Dialogue editing is, is really an art. Um, it's really an art figuring out how to work with room tone to make everything smooth. And then you have the sound designers, which is probably the most glamorous part, in my opinion, is you know the ones who are cutting sound effects and creating sound effects and going out in the world and finding sound effects and then manipulating them and, and putting them in. Um, you have the Foley artists who are the Foley walkers, who are the ones who are cracking celery on front of a microphone or splashing water around, you know, to, or punching a steak, you know, for the fight scene, all, all, all these, all the human things like the touching and, and the grabbing and the cloth, that's all Foley artists who are doing this live and uh, in, a, in a studio. And then you have the mixers, which somehow put the whole thing together and they're kind of the like that's that's where the process ends if if something is wrong the whole time it ends on the mixer so the mixer has maximum responsibility and uh those are those are the the people that i really i mean i admire all the all the jobs but especially mixers like it's such a difficult uh difficult job and it takes so much experience to do it well i i every time i go to mix a film i realize how difficult it is and, and how um how little i really know about it um yeah so now that's that's kind of you know in a nutshell there's that's, the, that's awesome rest. i i i that's so cool to know really i I love it. There's so much that so many people that need to be involved, so many different positions, and and I I, I love it. W which one is the one that you? Um, I don't know. Is there a choice that that you have? 
It depends. It depends on the, on the, on the budget of the project. The bigger the project, the more specialized um, those jobs will be. So a big Hollywood project will have a handful of sound recordists, a few dialogue editors, you know, hand, a handful of sound effects editors, uh, a few mixers. Um, it, it's a big old, big old thing. Smaller budgets, uh, you may have, um, you know, just a sound supervisor who's doing all of it. You may have a sound supervisor and uh, a dialogue editor or a mixer. It really varies. Um, you know, on the, the levels of film that I work at, it's usually either just me or it's me and another person. And so um, I'm doing all those jobs. It's definitely, you know, as as you work on bigger films, it's it's good to specialize, I think. I think in, in general, in life, it's good to specialize because especially when something is so complex, it's worth it just to have experts that are really working on it. Um, but a lot of my work actually is in the podcast field. I, I stumbled on podcasting really. And I just like with film, I realized that you can make a big impact with, with podcasting and, and actually, do, do you want to keep talking about film? I can, I can wait. I would, lo I would love to know about more about podcasting because it's also a big niche that's opening up right now because, you know, we're moving towards a generation, which. Is, is doing everything with sound, you know, the Alexa that people have in their house now, now, you know, they talk to something, they don't even have to take their phone. So things are just happening with sound, like just talking and speaking and answering. So definitely I can down the line podcasts are already growing. And so, yeah, I would love to know about that. Cool. Yeah. It, it's really amazing right, right now what's happening in podcast world. I mean, it's, it's getting bigger every day and it's getting bigger than people realize. I think mm. I just heard that Netflix is starting a new service. That's audio only um, of their T of their content, their movies and TV shows. Mm. Like they'll have audio description like they would do for, for hearing challenge people because they're realizing that podcast is, is so popular that they need to compete with that mm. because um you know, we can do other things. Well, we, when we can drive, we can walk, we can exercise, we can do dishes, we can cook. And that's, I think, really valuable for uh, today's society to be able to multitask as they take in content. Um, but there's a lot of power in the field. I mean, you, you can see just in like the, the early days, like serial, um, you know, serial resulted in, in the freeing of someone who was wrongly convicted of a crime. Um, there's, there's a lot of power in, in, in media, in, in podcast world right now. And that's kind of what I realized. And I, so that's how I, I entered into this field. Um, and my work, I work with a nonprofit called Accelerate Change and they basically, uh, they incubate other nonprofits, um, that like there's a, some of their partners are uh, Push Black, which is a um, a nonprofit media organization uh, for Black communities. I work with one uh, called the Pulso Project. Um, I work on a, a podcast for them that is um, meant for Hispanic communities, and all these ventures are engaging, are um, helping engage audiences for civic engagement and for voting and um there's just there's really big opportunities i think to to make a difference in this field as it becomes more and more and more popular all all around the world so you do post editing for that i, I do a lot more than that actually so um i i do the audio work as well but i i'm a producer so I also I also help write. Um, I help organize uh, the the seasons and the projects. Help. I mean, s several of these shows I've actually helped con conceive the the concept for the show with the host or the team. Um, production is, producer is kind of an all you know. It's a catch all kind of term that uh, you're you're the one who is making it work. Um, however, it needs to work. Whether that it was similar to what I did in music, actually. Um, you know, in, in the music world, 
a producer could be helping write the songs, helping hire the band, book the studios, you know, some of these are technical. And then in the sessions, you know, help the singers get the best performance out using whatever psychological or, or communicative tools you have. And in a sense, this is quite similar because a producer really needs to establish the vision, like the overall vision and figure out what it takes to make that happen. Um, so there's, there's a lot of things to it and it's different every day. Some days I'm writing, some days uh, I'm, I'm recording, some days I'm mixing, some days I'm in the fetal position on the floor trying to figure out what's next. <laughs> um, and, and I find podcast too is, it's one of the most complex uh, things I've had to do. You know, there's, even though film is so complex in a technical way, I find a bit of a freedom in it because it's also very linear. If I'm doing film, if I'm dialogue editing, I know what the goal is. I know that I need to make this dialogue sound smooth. Um, if I'm mixing, I know what the goal is. I need to make this sound right and hit hard and hit well. But in podcast world, you don't have those clear cut goals and you don't have someone to, to guide the way for you. You have to figure it out. And it's a whole different kind of challenge, especially when you're working with uh, narrative type shows um, where you're bringing all these elements together. You're going out and finding the interviews, putting that with a script and with music and creating a, a story out of it. Um, I think one of the things that uh, that I find comfort in is that I hear from people who are, you know, much more competent than me in the industry is that you always feel lost in the beginning, no matter what, no matter how much you've done it. I just listened to a, like a making of radio lab video yesterday where they were the, the host Jad Abumrad was saying how you always feel stupid in the beginning. <laughs> like no matter how many times you make episodes, you always feel stupid stupid in the beginning and then you keep <laughs> messing with it and moving it around and poking at it and eventually it comes together and that's actually probably the the biggest lesson I've learned through my life from audio was exactly that because it applies to every piece of audio and to the rest of my life that a problem will arise and if you're willing to just keep poking at it and messing with it eventually you will find your way through it. You may not have any idea how, but you will find your way through it if you're willing to just keep going at it, going at it, and going at it. That's, that's a wonderful experience that, that you had. Um, what would you say is it that, that really fuels your drive and thirst? Um, as, you, as you are also exploring your truth, you know, you're you making use of, of these, of the tools of, of the yogic science while working with sound. Um, what is it? What what is it that that fuels you? Because you said you work with um, NGOs and and yeah. Tell tell us about um, maybe a vision that that you have down down the line. Sure. A lot of of who I am has been shaped by Sadhguru's teachings. Um, I was so lucky to find Sadhguru at a relatively young age. Um, I think it was age, I think it was 20. And there's a lot of things that are just cemented in, in, into my mind. And, and one of those things is the response, responsibility is, you know, there's no there's no escaping that responsibility now, even if I wanted to. Um, so because of that, the logical question is, okay, well, what do I need to do? Like, what's the, uh, you know, if I'm responsible for everything that's happening, what's the next step for me to do to, to look at how to ease suffering and, and fix problems? And so that's that's the drive. That's every day. That's the drive, trying to figure out how to use my time and my energy in the most uh, useful way for, for the planet and for all the beings on it. 
Um, yeah, because I feel like a lot of people probably, uh, I mean, I can see people worrying about money a lot when they pursue music, especially, you know, worrying about how, how am I going to, like right now, maybe because of the situation, there's not a lot of films that are being filmed, you know. So people that are in the industry of sound and video, um, they might not pursue it because of of these reasons. So, uh, yeah, how how was how was that that for you? It's a good question. I mean, it definitely exists. That's that's a huge a huge part of of any career in life. Um, I mean, it, it has been a challenge for me, and I've really just recently. Uh, kind of for the first time kind of come to a more comfortable position um so i mean there's not a there's not an easy answer to that um because yeah i mean money is important to live if you know if you're if you're going to live in the world and not in the ashram like you have to make money um but i mean this was like when i was kind of post ashram trying to figure out what to do next i had this triangle that i formed and it was like okay the the triangle has three three legs that is do something important for the world do something that you love and do something that that makes money so it's like if you could at least get two of those in there um then that it's good but it's a it's a really careful balance i think finding you know, it's not easy to find something that that fits in the middle of those three points. Mm. But but I will say that I re I really believe that anyone can do anything if they're willing to put the time in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think if you're willing to put ten years into anything, then you'll succeed. Um, mm -hmm. There's a saying that I love that I think about every day. That is, people overestimate what they can do in one year and underestimate what they can do in 10. Um, you know, if you stick with it, you'll, you'll succeed. You may have to make sacrifices if you want to do it. But I mean, the most important thing to me is, is to really look at, is it worth it? Like, you know, thinking about all the time that's going to go into something, is it worth it as far as impact? Like, because it's really easy to put you know, 60, 70 years of work into something, turn around and realize that it really wasn't that important to you or to anyone else. So that, that to me is, is like the foundation is, okay, like what's the thing that is important if I'm really going to invest my life into it? And then the other things, then, then the next two come, then the, you know, doing what you love or something that stimulates you. Um, and then the, the earning money out of it. But to me, like it's that that doesn't matter without that foundation of importance. Because mm -hmm. if, if I'm making money at something, but it's not a service to the world, it's it's not important. And if it's not something that I I stimulates me, then also I mean, I guess you could get away with that. That's okay because if you're doing something important for the world, that in itself should be enough. But still. It sure is wonderful to be able to do something that you're excited about. Mm. Yes, oh. yes, and and I mean the world, what it, what it, what it really needs right now. I feel what 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 I guess um, the, the both of us are doing is is trying to see how we can contribute to the vision, you know, to the vision of of touching every single person on this planet. And so we all have, you know, certain talents. We all are draw, drawn to certain things, and and we we flower in those areas much easier than if you know we would try to. If I would try to paint a picture and like you know, but I'm I'm doing I'm here doing what I'm what I what I can. I totally agree, and and I I feel that way too. That everybody has their job. You know, there's so many things we need to do to right now in the world like there's so much work to be done that there is room for everyone in every task you know whether that's 
in in the political sphere and in, in the spiritual sphere and i mean there, there's just so much mm. work to be done like we need people that are doing environmental work we need people that are looking at fixing poverty and hunger we need people like said guru who are you know like uplifting us spiritually we need people in every single role so somewhere out there there's something for everybody yes i i love how you stick to it you know how you're you know what you're passionate about and you're doing it you know you're not trying to find reasons not to do it because that's that's what i i i myself went through and i see many people going through they uh, i felt passionate about something but i was overthinking it you know i was just overthinking it and then trying to 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 go another way which seemed easier and then coming back to the, to what i actually want to do and then again going off and then again coming back and so i would say only because of only because of sadguru and 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 his his methods i i started to acknowledge that i have you know whatever it is that i want to do i i i need to you know just pursue that if i if i go sideways i will never go anywhere you know if i take so 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 many different routes then i'll go i'll, I'll just stay in the same place yeah i think i think said grew is a big part of of why i feel that way also mm -hmm. because he talks about that a lot about like the one one pointed direction mm -hmm. um and you know, I haven't, I'm definitely not at a one pointed direction, but I've minimized my amounts of directions um, heavily to, to a handful of things. And, you know, I also am really, really into the, the concept of, of um, that, how to say this, daily growth, like whatever you're doing, if you do anything for 10 minutes every day, you will become really good at it. Like if you go and do 50 push-ups every day, that, that takes that takes 10 minutes. But like if you do that for a year, like it will make a huge difference. You know, if you um I'm trying to learn French right now. It's yeah. really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I realized okay, if I study for 20 minutes a day, mm. Or, and, and I'm doing that before you know it, several years have passed and you have a huge growth. So the same goes, of course, for your career. Like anything you're doing every day, you will get really good at. So it's it's really important to have that long view. And that's something I'm really thankful that I've I've come across is that like the short view is just so dangerous because you end up going in all these different directions every day. But if you can just kind of stop like, what do I really want? Like, look at it. Okay, how do I get there? It's it's this very like linear, logical method of like, okay, this step, then this step, then this step, and just keep doing that. <laughs> you know, I really needed to hear this. <laughs> I really needed to hear this. Yeah, I mean, things have been aligning in so many ways. It's crazy sometimes things are happening and you know, okay, this is what I'm doing. You know, this is, this is what I wanted to do. And things are starting to align and just happening by themselves. But the mind just, you know, tries to slip in and, and doubts are there. Fear is there. Conditioning is there. Uh, society is there. Friends, old friends or whoever, people are there. And so in so many ways, um, being distracted or... Uh, running away or getting caught up in, in social media, getting caught up in work, getting caught up in making money. So, yeah, I, I thank you so much for that perspective that that was on point. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's even like the goal itself can become a problem too. You know, I, I find that often it, it's basically like my whole life is just a constant re, like recalibration where I have to like, Oh, I'm off again, recalibrate. Like, because exactly like you said, it's like, oh, I'm paying way too much attention right now to like that I want this job to be cool, or I want yeah to make money, or I want to do this. And like I swear it's like once a week, I just have to sit myself down and be like, hey, remember why you're doing this? Like you're not doing this 
because it's super fun to do sound, you know, and to go into this part of it. You're not doing this because of, you know, because this part of the field makes a bunch of money. Like you were doing this for this specific reason to make impact. So are you following your path right now? Um, you know, is, is this, because there can be amazing opportunities that are not on your path. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a really, a real danger of life that like you start on that path and you, you know, you keep going down it, going down it. And before you know it, you're totally off where, where you were supposed to be. And, you know, that come back, come back, come back, recalibration all the time. <laughs> So important. Yeah, yeah. I'll keep that in mind. And I hope <laughs> everybody who, 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 who listens to this as well. Just, I, that's, yeah. I hope I keep that in mind. <laughs> that's awesome. Is there anything else that, that comes to your mind that you would, you would like to share about? Because I feel like you, you covered uh, a lot of things that I was curious about. And um, yeah, is there... yeah. Um, no, off the bat, I think that was like pretty much. That was a good run. <laughs> I, I really, I really enjoyed it. A, a very different perspective um, on so many things, you know, because I don't know, I just feel like. Um, You have been involved in, 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 an in, in an industry where I myself, I'm not aware of anybody who, who, who is in, in, in this in industry. And then, you know, you have a, a different perspective on it as well because of not just being involved, but also observing yourself being involved through meditation, through yoga. Totally, totally. You know, that, that's just like... <clears throat> like the only way to do it is, is, is that way. Like, like you did going to, you know, like solidifying yourself first in, mm. in sadhana. It's just like everything becomes a disaster. otherwise. <laughs> you know, like no matter how well you're doing or how good your intentions are mm. without that self-awareness, it's just like, you're going to make a mess. Mm -hmm. I, I sure I definitely was. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm. And and two, yeah, it's it's like kind of it reminds me of when Sadhguru is talking about like you know undercover yogis in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, not not that I consider myself to be anywhere like near being able to be called <laughs> a yogi, <laughs> but at the same time, at least like building up that awareness and then bringing that into the world in a, a field in an important way that is otherwise just like an industry. Mm -hmm. Definitely every single project that you're working on is, you know, in some way influenced by, by it because you yourself are, you know, you yourself are continuously working on it. And so I, I do feel that whatever we touch, it, it somehow leaves, you know, a little touch of Sadhguru there as well, because he's with us always. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And in, in, It's interesting because it just gets so like it becomes such a part of you that you don't even realize it. Mm -hmm. I think like you know, it's just like it just gets cemented into you. Like like I was talking about the responsibility and these other things. Mm -hmm. It's just so much that it's just how you are. It's not even like it's coming from somewhere else. Yeah, he's just he's just there, he's with you. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, this is awesome. This is this is my first uh, my first interview, first time I've been on someone else's podcast. Oh, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you for for taking the time. It was a pleasure to to hear about the story and 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 what you're involved in right now. Absolutely. Thank you. Love it. Feel free to subscribe, like, and share, comment. And we will be very happy to have you join on, on more. Namaskar.